Good day, ladies and gents. In this section, we're going to be covering advanced design, and it's just an introduction. As part of this course, we're not going to get into detailed advanced design methods, but at least you can be aware of what's out there. So to know what could be done in your building and what to look for and what to be careful of as well, because in the course we've been doing up till now, we've used certain fires. We've had standard fires and parametric fires and such. But you should be aware that there are a large variety of fire scenarios that you could consider. For instance, if I was designing the structure here, I could use a localized fire. If I have a leak of fuel, especially if it's a petrochemical facility, I could have a localized fire adjacent to my structure. And that might be quite a governing factor when it comes to the design of this element. Then I could have a traveling fire. Perhaps this is a large building and I wouldn't get to flash over in it, but I could have a traveling fire that moves through the building progressively from one part to the other and affecting different parts of the structure at different times. I could have computational fluid dynamic models, modeling the ventilation and the fuel and all those things inside there and apply that to my structure. And once again, as we've discussed, all of those require less or more information. You would have to see is what is suitable for your structure. On the one hand, you've got your standard fire, very little to do with ventilation and what's really in your structure, right through to other extremes and everything in the middle. Then going beyond advanced design models for our fire behavior, then we can also look at our heat transfer. Up until now, we've used simple Excel models and maybe you can use a bit of Abacus and other um, Sapphire and various uh, software packages for heat transfer. And you have different levels of modeling, even in terms of heat transfer and applying all the, the latest and greatest to take your then thermal, your, your fire condition into a thermal model of your structural condition. Once then you've got your, your structural model, once you know what the temperature profile is in my column or my beam or my slab, you can start designing it with, with various different methods. You can, for instance, the, the methods for composite floors. If this was a composite floor on top, there's various design methods, uh, the tensile membrane behavior method or Clifton slab panel method. And I could then design this for the nonlinear behavior that occurs. So as this fails and hangs from my primary beams, I can still get a reliable capacity and come up with a very efficient model using certain advanced design methods for, for slabs. I can start doing global modeling. So not just analyzing one column, because normally we consider one column at a time, but I could have a look at the whole frame. As my fire here, my localized fire is affecting this column, how does it expand? What forces are induced in it as it tries to expand? But then we've got to ask ourselves the question, is only one part of the structure is heated or is a large part of the structure is heated? And how does that respond? So those are some of the different considerations we may have to look at going from thermal model, um, the fire model, and then the structural model, ranging, as I said, from a simple beam or column right to global behavior. All of them are potentially safe, but they're just more or less economical or more or less real from your real scenario to your simplified lab scenario. A typical global analysis will generally show that there's more capacity than we expected, so that's good. But then we've got to know a lot more about the structure and the connections and all those other things. So these are some of the questions that you need to answer or ask while you're doing such a design. So with it, we're going to now continue on with advanced design methods for our structures in fire.